Hey Gearseekers, I'm Nick. Today we're checking out another Threadripper Pro board. This time it's from ASUS. What is it? It's the ASUS Pro. What? What? I can't. That's too long. Claire's got the name in front of it. What is it? Um, Pro WSWRX80E Sage SE Wi-Fi. Yeah. Yeah. That's what it is. Yeah. Should I do it just in case? So it's the Pro WSWRX80E Sage SE Wi-Fi. Uh, Ti. Tie. <laughs> <laughs> That's a mouthful if I've ever heard it. Anyways, guys, this video is not a review. So let's take a bit of a close look, see what comes in the box, what's on the board and everything that makes this board tick. Let's jump in. As usual with these motherboard videos, they're just overviews, they are not reviews, they're basically designed to show you guys what are on these brand new boards and what physically comes in the box. And just as a bit of a heads up, this is a very niche board for a very niche use case. It may or may not be your cup of tea, but a lot of the time on the channel, we get sent things or I request things that actually just really interest me and I want to get a closer look at it. And the other thing with this board as well, when we did the last sort of a pro board, you guys started talking about this one. I already knew that this one existed. I didn't think we were actually going to be able to get one, but here we are. Here it is. Let's take a closer look. All right, ladies and gents, let's take a bit of a close look at the ASUS Pro WSWRX80E Sage SE Wi-Fi. It's a bit of a mouthful. Going to refer to it as the WRX80 Sage because it makes a bit more sense. But let's get the motherboard out of the way so we can first off take a bit of a closer look at everything that comes in the box. Let's open up the top flap. What we're going to pull out first is actually something quite interesting straight off the bat. Now this is a VGA connector for the built-in BMC that's on this motherboard, so it does have integrated graphics if you were to be using this as a service, you don't need a GPU. There's also a set of SATA or SATA cables for your 2.5 inch SSDs or your spinning rust drives. Pretty standard inclusion here. There's also a bunch of screws and standoffs for the M.2 slots on the board and also for the storage card that comes with this board that we'll take a bit of a look at a little bit later on in the video. There's also this front panel connector. Now, basically this allows you to plug all of your cases, front panel wiring and lights and whatnot into a single block without having to guess what everything is. I like the boards include stuff like this. There's also the antenna for the built-in Wi-Fi 6 and Bluetooth 5.2. It's a standard ASUS shark fin type of antenna. There's also the user guide for the WRX80 Sage standard user guide here however this one includes a few more things that relate to the IPMI and that kind of stuff uh, which we're going to be covering over on kernel control as well as when we cover the gigabyte board as well and this little round plastic circular device which on a board like this is not uncommon to see. It is actually good that they do include this because chances are you might actually use an optical drive with a board like this in this type of system. All right, let's open up flap number two to reveal the storage card. Now, we do see this in some other high-end workstation boards and basically what this is, is a full by 16 PCIe Gen 4 storage card that has four M.2 slots in it. And the way this works is you enable bifurcation in the BIOS, you split a single slot by four. So you do by four by four by four by four by four, however many times I said that. Yeah, that's how the card works. We're not gonna be covering that in this video because we've done plenty of videos about that type of storage setup. But let's take a closer look at the WRX80 Sage. This thing is absolutely huge. It's an absolute beast. So let's uh, get a bit more acquainted. First off, there is the front panel audio connector. There's a serial port header. There's a bunch of headers for the BMC and IPMI stuff on the board. There's also a PWM fan connector. And quite curiously, there is a micro SD card slot. Now you might be asking why you would use something like this. You can install a hypervisor on this card so you don't need to run an actual drive for a hypervisor. So if you're running ESXi or Proxmox or something like that, you can run that directly off an SD card, which is well, micro SD card, which is really cool. There's two six pin PCIe power connected to send some extra juice to that motherboard with all of those slots. 
There's two USB 2.0 headers as well. This is pretty standard on motherboards. This is the VGA header for the built-in graphics that are on this board. There's also a PWM fan connector. Next to that are a bunch of switches that enable you to turn off VGA and some built-in settings. There's also the front panel connector for all your lights and all your wiring and all your switches and all that jazz. There's eight SATA or SATA ports for your 2.5 inch SSDs or your spinning rust drives. There's also two U.2 connectors for additional PCIe storage. There's another PWM fan header. There's a USB 3.0 header. There's a USB type C header. Now, this board actually has more 8 pin PCIe power connectors to send more juice to the board. There's a 24 pin power connector and a normal 8 pin EPS power connector. If we take a look across the top of the board, or the top right hand edge, there's another EPS power connector. There's a postcode LED screen so you can diagnose your system when it's booting up and two more PWM fan connectors. You'll also notice there is an additional power and reset button behind the 24 pin power connector. This board features seven full by 16 PCIe 4.0 slots. So you can use any of these slots for full by 16 connectivity. This is absolutely insane. And I love it. This board's got dual 10 gigabit ethernet built in, which can get quite hot. So there is a heat sink across the IO side of the board. There's also a 16 phase direct digital VRM set up on this board. And if we're looking at the heat sink on the right hand side of the board, this is where the VRM is. This board features AMD's WRX80 chipset, which supports eight channel memory and it is actively cooled. It is actually quite similar to the X570 chipset from doing a bit of research on it. So yeah, interesting stuff here, but it does support that eight channel memory. And speaking of that, this board features the STRX8 socket, which is not compatible with any other Threadripper chips except the Threadripper Pro chips. Now we do have the 32 core Threadripper Pro 3975WX, which we have featured in videos already, which we're gonna be using to test this board out as well. If we flip the board over, you'll notice it has a back plate that covers most of the board. And the next thing you'll notice is the size of the board. It's quite large. It's an extended ATX board, which doesn't really have a proper specification, but it's quite large. It is a, it's one of the biggest boards we've ever covered. Now, as I mentioned, it does feature that eight channel memory, which is quite unique to Epic processors and to Threadripper Pro. There's three built-in M.2 slots on this board. These ones can be run at SATA or Gen 4 PCIe. It's completely up to you, whichever you choose to use. But there is three in total. There's one along the bottom of where the chipset heatsink and fan is. There's one next to it. And there's one that sits right behind the VRM heatsink as well. If we take a look at the rear I.O., there is a clear CMOS button, a BIOS flashback button, the antenna connectors for the built-in Wi-Fi 6 and Bluetooth 5.2, dual 10 gigabit ethernet, USB type C, USB 3.2 gen two ports, as well as 7.1 digital surround sound with optical and SPDIF output. All right, ladies and gents, I hope you enjoyed this overview and look at the Asus Pro, sorry, I'm not looking at the camera because I can't remember this name. It's the Asus Pro WS WRX80 E Sage SE Wi-Fi. It is a bit of a mouthful anyway. This board, uh, the reason why it interested me was because like the Gigabyte board, it had many of the same features, but it focuses sli to slightly different market areas. So the Gigabyte board is definitely a far more server focused motherboard. Whereas this one is really geared towards workstation use. And the way we can tell that is because it's got a Wi-Fi 6 built in, uh, it's only got 10 gigabit ethernet. It doesn't have like IPMI in the same sense that the gigabit ports on the gigabyte board uh, can be used for IPMI. Obviously I haven't fired this up, so I'm not quite sure how the IPMI works on this board in particular, but I, it's gonna be much the same here. The other major difference between the gigabyte board and this one, which we're gonna be covering over on kernel control, we're gonna do a big side by side to show you all the differences. This one will do two terabytes of RAM, whereas the Gigabyte one only does one terabyte of RAM. Whether or not they can address that in a BIOS update is a whole nother thing. Um, from what I can see, the IPMI interface for this board and the Gigabyte board is exactly the same. Now that I've actually used the Gigabyte board quite a bit and we did use it for testing, the card that comes with this, the storage card, 
is similar to what we've seen with other high-end boards as well. So I do like that that's included. The other major difference with this board compared to the Gigabyte board as well, just from the top of my head is, this has U.2 connectors, whereas the Gigabyte board has slim SAS connectors. So a, a quite a big difference. This also has more M.2 slots and all of the slots on this board are by 16. So yeah, I think this is really interesting. It's actually quite insane. It's one of the biggest, uh, let's say, consumer focused motherboards I've ever seen. It's EATX, which we all know is a made up spec. It's not really a, a real spec. It just means, hey, this is ATX, but it's way bigger. So we don't know how to classify it. And that's exactly what this is. And if you guys are interested in getting one of these boards, although very expensive, very niche, the CPUs themselves could be quite hard to get as well. Uh, this one's going for around a thousand US dollars or around 1600 Australian dollars at the time of filming this video. Again, availability, I've got no idea what it would be like. And as I mentioned, this is a very specific motherboard for a very specific use case. Really, really cool, interesting stuff. And I do like that this one is a bit more workstation focused, which is kind of why I wanted to get my hands on it because this would be a board that I would personally use in my workstation. The only problem is I don't get to keep this one. So yeah, we don't get to keep everything, especially when it's like crazy high end stuff like this, but I did want to play around with it to see what made this thing tick. And we do have another video covering that coming to Kernel Control much later. If you guys like the music you heard here, I make all the music, it's available over on Patreon. You want to get early access to videos like this one, it's available over on Floatplane. Once again, thank you so very much for watching. I'm your boy, Nick with Gear Seekers. You peek, we seek. And yes, this thing is uh, pretty insane. I, I, I like it. it it's, it's very, very cool. And yeah, cinematic mode, so you can take a bit of a cinematic peek at this board. Let's do it. Yeah.